Hello, my friends. Welcome. Today, we're going to talk about the Start9 Embassy Pro. I finally got it in today, and so I'm going to do an unboxing slash setup run through so that you guys can see how this works. I'm not sure how many of these are out there. I know that I ordered this several months ago, and it just finally came in today. So let's dive in. What is the Embassy Pro? Well, the Embassy Pro is a collaboration between Start9 and Purism. Now, Start9 and Purism are both privacy-focused companies. Start9 uh, developed the Embassy, which we'll talk about here more in a moment, but their whole reason for existence is the idea and the notion of sovereign computing. And Purism is also in that space. They are also all about privacy, security, and all of that stuff in the digital space. So the Embassy Pro is a powerful, secure, and reliable private server. It's going to be powered by Start9's Embassy OS, and we'll walk through that here in just a little bit. It is a plug-and-play private server for, they list all kinds of things, power users, families, businesses, other organizations. The reality is this is a plug and play private server for just about everybody. Anybody who is interested or concerned with digital privacy and security, that's who the Embassy Pro is for. And what it does is it allows you to self-host web applications. Basically, you are your own cloud provider and all of your data is stored on your private cloud, your server, and it's outside of the prying eyes of the likes of Google and Facebook and everybody else. It truly is digital sovereignty. And so it's really kind of interesting from that perspective. If you're not interested in digital privacy and security and digital sovereignty, um, go ahead. This probably is not going to be a video for you. But for those of us who are interested in this, this is the Embassy Pro. Now, a lot of times the question that comes up is why? Why bother doing all this? We could just use Google. We could just use uh, Dropbox or any of these other things. And at the end of the day, it comes down to the difference between true cloud computing, and what Start9 calls sovereign computing. And at the end of the day, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. Your phone, your laptop, all of that are just remote controls to access somebody else's computer. You're really not in control. The host of the data is in control. So in the cloud computing paradigm, there is no real privacy. Censorship is commonplace. We've seen this all over the place, whether we're looking at Facebook or YouTube or any of these other things, censorship is commonplace. And the problem is, well, censorship is bad generally, but at this level, you have corporations deciding what is and is not appropriate, okay? So censorship's commonplace. Hacks are ultimately inevitable, these companies, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not giving them a pass by any means. They're pretty good at security because they have to be. That's a big part of their business model. But hacks are inevitable. We've seen it time and time again, whether there is some database that's left open or rogue actors internal to the organization are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, or if there's just a compromise of admin type credentials. We've seen that a couple of times with things like Twitter. So hacks are going to happen. That's kind of commonplace in the cloud computing arena. So the question then becomes, well, how safe is your data really? And at the end of the day, there's a cost to cloud computing. There's a cost for everything, my friends, but in cloud computing, there's a cost. Whether you're paying for a service, and we hope that the service is doing what we want it to do, and we hope that they are being as secure as they can be, etc. There's a cost, whether I'm paying cold, hard cash money for that cost or am I paying 
the cost with my data, meaning companies like Google. And I, listen, everybody hates Google. They've done a lot of really cool things. They've made some cool stuff. But at the end of the day, the product is you. You are the product. The user is the product. They didn't create, arguably, the world's greatest search engine about the best email platform, these online document platforms, and YouTube, online video hosting. They didn't create those because they're benevolent. They created those so that they can sell advertising. And so the advertisers truly are their customers. Their users happen to be the product that they're selling to the advertiser, right? So it's kind of an interesting little ship there. The other thing is Google particularly wants, and all of them, they want to give you targeted ads. It does mean no, it does an advertising company no good to give me an ad about, I don't know, ice skates. I don't ice skate. Don't know shit about ice skating. I'm never going to ice skate. So that's a wasted impression. However, if they've got access to all of my data, emails, documents, etc., they can give me targeted ads. Oh, turns out I should give this person not an ad about ice skates, but maybe I should give them an ad about keen hiking boots because this person does things outdoors and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's really what they're doing. So the cloud computing side of things, we're putting all of our stuff on someone else's computer. On the sovereign computing side of things, this is when we're running our own private server. We are in control. We don't have to rely on others to process or store your data because you're doing it yourself. In the sovereign computing paradigm, concerns over things like privacy, censorship, hacks, and fees, they practically disappear. I don't have to worry about some company having my data because I have it. I don't have to worry about some company saying I can't post this or I can't post that because I'm hosting it myself. It's available through whatever means I'm hosting. Hacks, now, not for nothing, this is one of those things. Hacks do disappear to a degree. However, in the sovereign computing world, the user is responsible for security. Things like updates, things like making sure patches are done, all of that. That's up to the user. There is no third-party company that's saying, hey, update your stuff, or hey, we've implemented these fixes to ensure security. There's not a whole security team behind us. It's up to the user. But I'd still, it's a chance I'm willing to take. And then, of course, there's fees versus we have on the cloud computing side recurring fees, in the sovereign computing world, all of my fees are really is buying the equipment. That's my initial outlay. And then my continuing fee is sort of my time to manage the device. So it's just a bit of a trade-off. I would argue that privacy, digital privacy and security is worth that trade-off. Now, this is sort of uh, the cloud computing and sovereign computing models in pictures for you. And, I, and to be fair, my friends, I got these pictures from the Start9 website, but they do a really nice job of sort of explaining what's going on. So here on the cloud computing side, we're at the bottom. Everybody else's needs are on top of us. We've got us and then all the apps that we're using, right? And all of the data that those apps are collecting or creating or whatever, they all ultimately end up on third-party servers. And that's where the other computer, the other person's computer is that third-party server. Server. So all of our data is there. Again, in the server computing model, um, Embassy OS sort of becomes our base layer. That is our start point. And from there, we build our pyramid or build our house or however you want to look at it on that good secure foundation that is Embassy OS. And on Embassy OS, there goes our data and our services. And ultimately, at the top of the rung or at the top of the pyramid, I am in charge. We are in charge of what happens with that data. So Start9 has a couple of different products. They have the 
Embassy One, which is a their original product, and I own one of those, and they work really nice. Uh, but it's a Raspberry Pi based personal server. It runs Embassy OS, which is what Embassy OS was originally designed to run on what's called ARM architecture, which is how the Raspberry Pi does its computing stuff. Really doesn't matter for our purposes. It runs Embassy OS. It's really cool. Comes in this little case. You could, well, they put it together. You buy it, plug it in, good to go. Costs you about 470 bucks. Um, it's a small eight gigabyte Raspberry Pi uh, board. So it's not a very high powered computer. Uh, and there are kind of limitations with what this personal server can do just based on the computing power. And we're using storage. The storage is a uh, one or two terabyte external hard drive. So we've got these pieces and parts that are kind of cobbled together with this really nice uh, operating system to have this personal server. It's relatively cheap at, you know, under 500 bucks and plug and play. Super awesome. The Embassy Pro is the flagship item. It is sort of the next evolution of the Embassy. And it is a collaboration between Purism and Start9. It also runs Embassy OS. Now, I will say the price is a bit higher. It's about $16.99 for an Embassy Pro. But the difference in capability and computing power is night and day. It's just night and day. Here we're going to be running a um, Intel Core i7 processor, which is what you would see in a desktop grade computer. It's got a graphics uh, capability. The memory, 32 gigabytes of memory versus 8 gigabytes, so 4x the RAM that's available to the machine, and a 2 terabyte M2 NVMe storage drive just means it is really big, two terabytes, and really fast in that NVMe slot. We've also got a bunch of other ports, USB 3.0 ports, we've got a couple of two, uh, USB 2.0 ports, and we've got a USB-C port on this device, as well as an HD, uh, HDMI and display port, so you could plug this thing and you know, use it as a computer, I guess, uh, and we've got good networking. This is a really good box for what we're going to use it for. So this is awesome. Now, I said this is a collaboration between Start9 and Purism. This is basically the Purism Librem Mini. And as configured with 32 gigabytes of RAM, two 16 gigabyte RAM sticks, and a two terabyte M2 NVMe, as configured from Purism, this would be a $1,937 purchase. So right off the bat, it's way cheaper than just buying the box by itself. And it has got Embassy OS. And this is a whole new retooled Embassy OS. Remember I said before, the original Embassy OS was tooled to run on ARM architecture. This Embassy OS is tooled to run on the x86 architecture. If you're not a nerd, it doesn't really matter. Just know that this software, this Embassy OS, has been specifically run, configured to run on this Intel Core i7. Now, another thing that's kind of interesting to note is Intel management is disabled on the Embassy Pro, just like it is on the Purism offerings. So what this means is it's a little more private and secure than the standard Intel Core i7 because it doesn't have that Intel management enabled. Um, so that's a good privacy feature, right? We don't have to worry about Intel seeing and, and, and doing anything with our processor. So this is a huge upgrade. I'm super excited uh, that this finally came in today. Uh, I got the notification about a week ago that they were shipping and uh, that was awesome. Not going to lie, it was hard to remain patient over the course of a week or so to actually get the device here, but it is here. And of course, like I said, we're talking about Embassy OS. Embassy OS is a Linux-based operating system that is really custom-built 
for self-hosting open source software. This allows anybody to run their own server without needing all of those traditional systems administration types of skills. Listen, could you or somebody go do what Embassy OS and the Embassy Pro does? Yeah, you probably could if you know how to do all kinds of stuff. If you know how to run systems administration, if you know how to run things like Docker and, and, and all of these other things, yeah, you could probably do it cheaper. Not much cheaper. I don't think you could do it much cheaper, but you could certainly do it cheaper if that's what you wanted to do. This whole system allows you and me, eh, I'm, I'm kind of a technical guy. I could probably do this. In fact, I have done this on some other Raspberry Pis. I will tell you, giant pain in the ass. I'm just being honest. It's it's a giant pain in the ass to try to do this on your own. Uh, Embassy OS, I've had my Embassy One for eh, probably a year, maybe a little over a year. It's great. Uh, very easy. Big Bird Cookie Monster, simple. Anybody can do it. And Embassy OS really kind of is the backbone of this hardware that that I've purchased this embassy pro so I am very excited uh, to actually run it so let's talk about how this thing came um, I don't really know how to do unboxing videos I'm kind of old school I just took some pictures and now we're looking at a PowerPoint and I'm talking through it so the packaging came really nice uh, very discreet packaging nothing on it other than the label and a fragile sticker um, Standard brown box, well taped, no problem. Inside, uh, the actual device itself was encapsulated in these little, you know, packing foam peanuts or whatever. So very secure, uh, no problem. Opened it up and uh, I was very happy to see that it was well packaged. Then when I opened the, got, got all the packaging out, uh, this is what I first saw here in the middle. A beautiful box. And it turns out, I apparently was one of the first 100 to either order or fulfill my order from the pre-order. And so because of that, I got a custom-painted box by the artist Maddox. Uh, I guess Start9 commissioned Maddox to either do individual art on these boxes or maybe it was a run of... Uh, you know, various hand pieces, arts. I think they're individual though, because if we look on the left, uh, this is Maddox doing a box uh, in the email that they sent me and said, hey, you're going to get one of these special boxes. And we can see it looks quite a bit different than the box I got. So I'm pretty sure each one of these is individual. And that's really freaking neat. And then here on the right, we've got the artist Maddox actually doing some work on these various different boxes. And we can see here that he spray painted each one of the boxes black and was doing his thing. So thank you, Start9, for that. Thank you, Maddox, for that. Uh, this is really cool. I will leave a link. Well, I'll leave a link to Start9, Purism, and Maddox all in the description. But this is what I saw. A beautiful hand art box that was covered in plastic uh, to keep it safe and secure in transit. And then when I turned over the box, I was able to see that there are security seals to ensure that there was no tampering with the device in transit. Uh, those were in place as I expected them to be. So that's a nice little touch from Start9 there. And then inside the device, uh, open up the box, I saw that there's a, a little, little information card and a sticker, and of course our device there under some more foam packaging. The device was there, well packaged, looks really, really nice. And so here is the device itself. Uh, on the left here, we have the front of the device. We've got several uh, USB ports on the front to include a headphone jack. Probably not something I'm really going to need, just given what this use case is. But it is there, uh, and it just goes kind of to show that, hey, this really is sort of a uh, user-grade computer comparative to a like a Raspberry Pi. So on the left, we've got the front. Here in the center, this is what the side looks like. Both sides look the same, so I only took the one picture. And then on the back, we can see all of the 
different uh, I.O. and power and networking stuff here. So uh, the power jack here on the left, we've got our um, internet or networking cables, some more USB 3s. We've got a USB-C here on the right. And then, of course, we do have this HDMI and uh, DisplayPort outputs so that we could, if we wanted to, hook a monitor up to this device. Overall, uh, the device is, it, it looks very good. In the pictures that you see on the internet, uh, they look black. In person, it looked a little more... Um, like grayish, greenish, bluish. It wasn't. It didn't look as black as I expected it to. Uh, so I'm not sure if that is a like a custom thing uh, for like maybe the first ones, or if that's just the color that Start Nine's using. In any event, it is going to look great wherever you put it. Mine is going to go in a server rack, uh, but if you put this thing on your TV stand and use it as uh, like that way, it'll look just fine. Won't look out of place at all. So with that, let's dive into the Embassy Pro setup. Before we jump into the actual setup of the Embassy itself, I just want to show you uh, real quick. This is the Start9 uh, website, so start9.com. This is their website, and this is the actual device we're looking at, the Embassy Pro. Uh, looks like it's on sale at $16.99. I believe it's $18.99 is the normal price now. Fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, depending on where you're at, um, this device is not going to be renewed as far as shipping goes uh, until January 4th, which is just a couple of weeks away. Uh, so this device is out there or it is available for you to purchase, I should say. So, you know, if you like this video or whatever and you want one, just go get one. Here's the thing. I'm not doing this uh, for any other reason than... I just think this is a cool device. I paid full, well, I paid pre-order price for the Embassy Pro. I paid for it, you know, real money uh, out of my own pocket. Start9 didn't have me do this. Purism didn't have me do this. Uh, this is not sponsored in, in any way, shape, or form. Of course, why would it be? There's like 12 subscribers to my channel. Um, but this is the device. So check them out at start9.com. And then we've got uh, Purism. So Purism is kind of one of the, I call them kind of one of the OG sort of um, digital privacy and security focused uh, companies. Uh, they've been around, I, I'll be honest, I don't know how long they've been around. I've heard of them for years, uh, at least the last three or four years probably. Unfortunately, to this point, I don't have any of their devices. Well, I suppose I do. I've got the, the Libra Mini um, collab with Start9, but uh, I would be interested in hearing your guys' thoughts. If you guys have any of the Librem devices, uh, let me know in the comments. That would be kind of cool. Uh, I'm probably going to look to save my shekels and get like a Librem 5 phone and also maybe uh, the Librem 14. This is a pretty cool uh, laptop. Uh, but anyway, so this is the Librem Mini. Um, basically, it starts off at $7.99 that we used or that, uh, that we got from Start nine, their collaboration, 32 gigabytes of RAM. That's a $259 update, uh, a two terabyte NVMe storage drive. That's an $879 update. So if I was to buy this device on its own, of course, why say on its own, you get the pure OS, uh, the purism operating system, uh, with this, but it's 1937 bucks. So we got a pretty fair deal. All things considered, uh, I got in on the pre order. So I think I paid uh, I don't remember what I, what did I pay 40 or 50 bucks to do the pre-order. And then I think I paid all in like 1500 bucks for the device. So I got a little bit of a break because I, uh, pre-ordered, but you know, even at full bull retail, pretty good price, particularly when we consider that, uh, start nine, you can, now here's the thing, my friends, you can go out, get your own hardware and set this, uh, embassy up yourself. So you can get a raspberry Pi. I, I presume you could get a, uh, purism or similar. I'm sure this is a, I don't know if this is an Intel nuke. I don't know exactly what little computer this is. Uh, but you could get this computer and you could run, um, embassy on it. Um, I think 
the cost for embassy. I don't know where that is. Uh, I thought there was a place I could buy that, but I guess not. Maybe you can uh, compile it from source, whatever. Um, it is something that is available to you if you want to go do this on your own. So lots of options for people who are interested in this space. Enough about all of that. Uh, let's dive into actually setting up the embassy. Now, it's really simple. You plug in your Ethernet cord or Ethernet wire, whatever you want to call it, to your network, right from the device to your network, and you plug in the device. When you plug in the device, it's going to take, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 seconds, and then you're going to hear some noise. That means, hey, the embassy is on, it's ready to go. Then all you have to do, go to embassy.local on a computer that is on your local network, and boom, this is what we get. So I told you before that I have an embassy one. I'm going to go ahead and keep running that embassy one. Uh, I'm going to end up taking a bunch of the services off. I'm just going to use it as a Bitcoin node. But I'm going to run that. Uh, I'm going to let it do its thing. I'm going to set this Embassy Pro up fresh. So to do that, um, listen, there's a way you could recover. Uh, I'm not doing that. I'm just starting fresh. So I'm going to start fresh, getting started with a brand new Embassy. There we go. So um, it says, hey, the drive in your Embassy data is going to be uh, stored. Yep, whatever. Uh, okay, click on it. Choose a password. Now, you got to put a password in there, and we want to make it strong. Uh, so give me just a second. There we go. So it looks like those match as they should. And let's go ahead and click the Finish button. We click the Finish button. It says, hey, we're going to initialize the embassy. We're going to start setting it up for you. This is super simple. I didn't have to do anything. I had to plug it in, give it network access, and make a password. That's it. And now all of this is happening for me. So I'm not sure how long this is going to take. Oh, look at that. Took less than a minute. And uh, there we go. So Embassy Local was set up uh, for purpose for setup purposes only. Will no longer work. Uh, download my permanent address information. So I'm going to go ahead and download that. Okay. And basically what you get there is a .html file. And there you go. So let me uh, dive into the HTML file and we'll be back to go to the embassy login. All right. So we've set up is complete. Life is good. All we have to do now is download our permanent address information. And what you're going to download is a little HTML file. And basically what it gives us is it gives us our dot local name to access our embassy on our home network. It also gives us our Tor address for our embassy so that we can access this thing on the go. Now, you need to download your address info so you've got it. Store that safely. Uh, you're also going to want to download the certificate. So when you download the certificate, it's basically a a security certificate that allows your device to access the embassy on your local network. So follow the instructions. Uh, I've already done that. Go ahead and follow the instructions that Start9 gives you. I'm on a Mac, so follow those instructions. Uh, they work really well so that you can just type into your search bar or your address bar to get to the actual embassy itself after this phase is complete. So let's go ahead and click on the go to embassy login and boom, here we are at the embassy. The embassy is all set up. You saw that in real time. It took like three minutes. Uh, all I got to do is type in my password. So I'm going to type in the password I made at the beginning. Oops, helps when I type it correctly. Sorry about that. There we go. And now we just click login. I'm not going to save. It says it's an invalid password. That's super awesome. I love it when that happens. There we go. Now we're logged in. And here we are into the actual Embassy OS view, right? Everything is now going to be done through our browser. Listen, I'm sure there's some really technical person who could tell you how to log in through SSH and all this stuff. 
none of that matters to me. I can tell you already looking at it, it looks different than my Embassy One. Maybe it was just refreshed or updated or whatever for uh, this particular release. Uh, but here we are at our services. So services are the applications that your embassy is going to run. And we can get those services from the marketplace. Okay. Uh, here we also have the option to download and trust our embassy certificate again. We can create a backup. Uh, this will give us our information about our embassy. We have our user manual. And if you need help, uh, you can always reach out to the wonderful Start9 uh, team and also their community. The community is on uh, Matrix Chat. So you can reach out to them and get any help that you may need. So let's dive into the marketplace. And I'm just going to install a couple of things here to get started because I know it's going to take a bit of time. So uh, our services, remember, are the actual applications that we're going to use. Um, these in this particular marketplace are packaged and maintained by Start9 themselves. So if you have an issue or have questions related to a service in this given marketplace, this registry, um, they've got support staff who will take care of you. So uh, we can see here we've got some featured tools. I'm just going to go to all so that we can kind of walk through these here real quick. Now, one of the big things that uh, people really like to do with Start9 embassies is they like to run their own Bitcoin node. Uh, and basically what a Bitcoin node is, it allows you to verify transactions yourself. So uh, you can run the full Bitcoin core node, which I'm going to do. Uh, you've also got a real private messenger, real-time private messaging here through Cups Messenger. Uh, we've got a lightning wallet here in Spark Wallet. We've got Ghost. Ghost is a self-hosted blogging platform. Uh, Photo View, which is um, probably like photo saving. I don't intend to use that. It's not for me. Uh, Lightning Network Daemon. Uh, this is one of those things that you're going to have to have if you want to run the Lightning Network on your embassy. Uh, Agora is a way that you can sell files for Bitcoin. So you can, you know, make a book or whatever and sell it through Agora on your own site that you're hosting on the Tor network. We've got some um, other lightning stuff. Uh, Mastodon. Mastodon. This is a real big thing now with, uh, oh, everybody's pissed off at Elon Musk, so they want to go to Mastodon. Uh, basically, it's a free open source social network server, so you can run your own Mastodon server. Um, you know, I've fiddled with Mastodon. I think it's trash comparative to Twitter, but anyway, uh, that's there. It's available for you if you want to. Probably not something I'll use. Uh, Synapse, which is a uh, implementation of the Matrix Protocol, which is a free, or pardon me, I should say end-to-end -end encrypted, free and open source uh, chat protocol and a chat uh, ability. Again, probably not something I'm going to use. We've got Mempool, which is a Bitcoin node and network visualizer, so you can do your own searches on your own hardware for what's going on with Bitcoin. Uh, we've got some other Lightning stuff. Uh, RoboSats, which is a simple private Bitcoin exchange. That's kind of cool. Uh, I'm kind of a nerd, kind of into the Bitcoin stuff, so uh, I'll probably uh, fiddle with that. We've got a Lightning Node Manager, some, some more Lightning stuff. Uh, sync thing. This is allowing. This will allow you to synchronize file between your devices in real time. Uh, so you can have this set up on your embassy and share files between maybe multiple computers that you have, or maybe your phone and your computer, whatever. Kind of like a Dropbox or a Google Drive, that kind of a thing. Then we've got uh, Vault Warden. This is a secure password manager. I'm a big fan of password managers because otherwise I have to remember them and. Uh, I don't always remember them. <laughs> so I remember one good, long, complex password and Vault Warden or Bitwarden takes care of the, takes care of itself. Vault Warden is an implementation of Bitwarden. Um, so you can do that. Uh, I will probably run that. Sphinx Chat, this is uh, another chat on the Lightning Network. Haven't ever fooled with it. Maybe it's awesome, maybe it's not. I'm not sure. Uh, probably just not something I'm going to end up needing. Spectre's a... Uh, uh, a web GUI or a graphical user interface for Bitcoin Core. Uh, BTC, pay ter BTC Pay Server. This is kind of cool. Uh, this is a Bitcoin and cryptocurrency payment processor and uh, point of sale system. So you can basically create a store 
where you take Bitcoin for your goods and services. So this is kind of neat. I'll probably end up setting that up. Uh, we've got some more lightning stuff. Git T, uh, if you're a nerd and you like to do, um, you know, GitHub, basically Git T is a self-hosted um, implementation of GitHub or of the Git protocol. We've got Electors, which is uh, an Electrum server, which is again for Bitcoin. We've got Burn After Reading. This is kind of neat because this is, um, you could share one-time messages, right? So you could share a message in files that are destroyed after they're viewed or destroyed after a, a given amount of time, but you're hosting them, right? It's not up to somebody else. So this is something that you can do. So you send me your link and boom, I look at the link, I look at the document, and then that document or the link itself is destroyed and I can't look at it again. Uh, Bitcoin proxy, this is one of those things that we're going to need for uh, to use some of these other items. Uh, embassy pages, this is kind of cool. Uh, it allows you to create whole websites that are hosted on your embassy and they're accessed through the Tor network. And finally, we have uh, file browser, which is a simple cloud data storage and sharing device so that you can uh, maybe store your embassy pages in a folder and the embassy pages can be reached via the file browser, that kind of a thing. So lots of different things that are going on here. Here's the cool thing. The start nine folks are always adding new stuff, right? They're always adding new stuff. So things that become more and more useful uh, to people over time. So maybe at some point there will be an implementation of next cloud or something like that. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Now, the cool thing is start nine says, Hey, look, we've packaged this together. We've developed this operating system. Uh, and we have this registry or this marketplace where you can pull things to use on your embassy, but they also allow you to use other marketplaces. So uh, I'm not familiar with any other registries off the top of my head. Um, but if somebody else has a registry, I could go to their registry and I can pull the package that I want to from them. So kind of cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add, well, let's check updates first. Let's check the updates here. All, all of our services are up to date. Great notifications. This is where uh, any notifications about your server or anything that's going on are going to be here and then we have our uh, system information here um, so we can do stuff there. So going back to my marketplace, uh, I'm going to go ahead and download uh, Bitcoin Core. So all I got to do is click on it, click the green install button, and it's going to install this for me. So uh, it's going to do its thing. I can see what's going on. It's downloaded, it's validated, and now it is unpacking that. And eventually, I'm going to have to go in here and um, use whatever I'm going to have to do. So it says open HTTPS. Let's see if that works. Yep, I'm just going to go ahead and I don't really want to learn more. Firefox, why do you hate me? I just want to open the freaking thing. There we go. So now I'm using a secure connection uh, in my house here. Put in my password again. There we go. And now we are logged in um, with HTTPS. So we can see here that the service has been installed. It needs configuration. Click on it and it will tell me what it needs to configure. I can click on the configure button. Um, Okay, Bitcoin Core is automatically configured with the recommended defaults. Make whatever changes you want, then click save. I'm just going to go ahead and hit save. And it's going to do its thing. So when I hit start, now what's going to happen is it's going to do its thing. And it's going to take a while for the Bitcoin blockchain to be downloaded onto my machine locally. Uh, it's about 300 gigabytes, give or take. Uh, and it may take a couple of days. Here's the thing. It's going to take that much time because all of this is running through Tor or the Onion Routing Network. So it's a little bit slower. It's not, you know, blazing up and down fast speed. 
uh, but it's just going to do that in the background. So I've got that going. That's really all I intended to do today was get that uh, sync started. It'll take however long it takes. That's fine. And here tomorrow or the next day, uh, I'll get in and I'll come back and I'll start fiddling with more of this stuff. But with that, my friends, this is the Embassy Pro quick unboxing, quick setup, getting Bitcoin started um, really is all I wanted to do. Again, um, just thought I'd share, hadn't seen anything out there yet, so maybe this will be the first, I don't know. Uh, but if you like this sort of content, let me know in the comments. Please do like, share, and subscribe this video uh, to the folks who you think would appreciate it. Let me know in the comments, like I said, if you want to see anything else, uh, and maybe I'll continue to make this sort of content. So with that, hope you all have a great day. Let me know if there's anything you need in the comments, and I look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Take care.